Welcome to chapter five on managing stress. So in this chapter, we will attempt to examine the source of stress, understand that we have control over our stress. Um, we're going to explore the relationship of our beliefs to the experience of stress. And then we're also going to look at post-traumatic stress disorder, the basic causes of it and treatments. And we want to provide a context for understanding sexual abuse and harassment in this chapter. And then finally, we're going to describe and discuss various approaches to managing stress. So stress is defined as an event or series of events that leads to strain, which often results in physical and psychological health problems. Stress is really a term that we use to describe like your physical, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral responses to events that you consider to be threatening or challenging in some way. Um, and so stress is really your reaction to something that you feel like is out of your control or is just very difficult to manage. Um, and these threats or challenges are called stressors. And so what constitutes a stressor, it really depends on the person um, and depends on the person's interpretation of an event. So if one person has like a fear of heights, then bungee jumping is going to be a stressor for that person. But if another person is like an adrenaline junk junkie and uh, has gone bungee jumping before and has no fear of heights, then bungee jumping wouldn't be a stressor. So what is uh, stressful to one person might not be stressful to another person. But there are actually two types of stress. There is eustress and distress. And so eustress is a good stress. It provides us with um, kind of the necessary motivation to strive for the best. Um, it's the thing that gets us to go to the doctor when we're sick, to finish our homework on time. Um, it's motivating. It stops us from procrastinating. It's exciting. Um, it increases our creativity. And then there's kind of the negative stress or what's called distress. And uh, distress is the negative effects of stress that can deplete an individual and lead to fragmentation. So it's really the effect of unpleasant and undesirable stressors. It's negative stress. It depletes us and it can lead to health problems. So if you look at the slide, you'll see um, a bunch of different kind of indicators that you might be experiencing distress. Let's watch a video on how distress affects our uh, physical health. Are you sleeping restlessly, feeling irritable or moody, forgetting little things, and feeling overwhelmed and isolated? Don't worry, we've all been there. You're probably just stressed out. Stress isn't always a bad thing. It can be handy for a burst of extra energy and focus, like when you're playing a competitive sport or have to speak in public. But when it's continuous, the kind most of us face day in and day out, it actually begins to change your brain. Chronic stress, like being overworked or having arguments at home, can affect brain size, its structure, and how it functions, right down to the level of your genes. Stress begins with something called the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, a series of interactions between endocrine glands in the brain and on the kidney, which controls your body's reaction to stress. When your brain detects a stressful situation, your HPA axis is instantly activated and releases a hormone called cortisol, which primes your body for instant action. But high levels of cortisol over long periods of time wreak havoc on your brain. For example, chronic stress increases the activity level and number of neural connections in the amygdala, your brain's fear center. And as levels of cortisol rise, electric signals in your hippocampus the part of the brain associated with learning, memories, and stress control, deteriorate. The hippocampus also inhibits the activity of the HPA axis, so when it weakens, so does your ability to control your stress. That's not all, though. Cortisol can literally cause your brain to shrink in size. Too much of it results in the loss of synaptic connections between neurons and the shrinking of your prefrontal cortex the part of your brain that regulates behaviors like concentration, decision-making, judgment, 
and social interaction. It also leads to fewer new brain cells being made in the hippocampus. This means chronic stress might make it harder for you to learn and remember things, and also set the stage for more serious mental problems like depression and eventually Alzheimer's disease. The effects of stress may filter right down to your brain's DNA. An experiment showed that the amount of nurturing a mother rat provides its newborn baby plays a part in determining how that baby responds to stress later in life. The pups of nurturing moms turned out less sensitive to stress because their brains developed more cortisol receptors, which stick to cortisol and dampen the stress response. The pups of negligent moms had the opposite outcome and so became more sensitive to stress throughout life. These are considered epigenetic changes, meaning that they affect which genes are expressed without directly changing the genetic code. And these changes can be reversed if the moms are swapped. But there's a surprising result. The epigenetic changes caused by one single mother rat were passed down to many generations of rats after her. In other words, the results of these actions were inheritable. It's not all bad news, though. There are many ways to reverse what cortisol does to your stressed brain. The most powerful weapons are exercise and meditation, which involves breathing deeply and being aware and focused on your surroundings. Both of these activities decrease your stress and increase the size of the hippocampus, thereby improving your memory. So don't feel defeated by the pressures of daily life. Get in control of your stress before it takes control of you. So there are different uh, categories of stressors or sources of stress, environmental, psychological, social. So we're going to start with environmental sources of stress. And the first one that we're going to talk about are catastrophes. And these are unpredictable large-scale events that create a tremendous need to adapt and adjust, as well as overwhelming feels, uh, feelings of threat. So there's really strong stressors that occur suddenly and they affect many people at once, like 9-11, war, hurricanes, tornadoes, plane crashes, things like that. And what's interesting about catastrophes is that they may produce less stress in the long run than events that are maybe a little less devastating. And the reason that psychologists uh, say that is, is because these catastrophes, they happen, and then they're over. They're behind you. And you have lots of people to talk to, to relate to about it. We're kind of all in on it together. So that um, tends to help us to get over it faster. There is the exception of terrorist attacks because they're intentional, and many people fear that those attacks are going to happen again in the near uh, future. And there are some, some studies that show that the government terror alerts, like when we have the a red alert or the orange alert, like the different color systems that indicate our threat of terrorism, that those actually increase stress in people. Um, and then another environmental stressor are personal stressors, and these are major life events that have immediate negative consequences, but those negative consequences generally fade with time. Um, so it could be things like Family death, divorce, losing your job, failing at something really important to you. But a personal stressor can even be something positive like marriage or moving or getting a new job or having a baby. Um, they usually produce major immediate stress reactions, but then those stress reactions kind of taper off as you acclimate and habituate to the new um, experience or, or the new baby or the new marriage or whatever the new situation is. And then another environmental stressor are hassles, and these are the daily annoyances of everyday life. Um, they cause minor irritations, and they're not really problematic if it's just like one or two a day, but they can have long-term ill effects if they compound, kind of pile up together, and then if they continue for a long period of time. So examples of hassles are um, being stuck in traffic, um, any type of overcrowding can be uh, stressful. So even if you're like at Disneyland and people are standing too close to you, um, 
or there are long-term hassles, which could be like job dissatisfaction or unhappy relationship. Things like poverty can be considered under the category of hassles um, because, you know, poverty is obviously a lack of money, which leads to a lack of resources, including medical care. Um, we see that overcrowding does tend to be associated with poverty, like people that are in poverty will often um, live, many people will live together in a small space. Um, poverty also usually includes being in a noisy environment. Um, there's increase of illness, violence, and drug abuse, all which are kind of stressors that go hand in hand with poverty. And then another hassle is considered job stress. So job stress is um, having like a heavy workload, a lack of variety or meaning, lack of control or decision-making power, working long hours, working in poor physical conditions, or having a lack of job security. So some psychological sources of stress include frustration, which is defined as the feeling that something is blocking attainment of one's needs and goals. Um, externally, frustration could come from traffic, for example. Internal frustration could be uh, coming from like wanting to be a basketball player but not being tall enough. And so um, responses to frustration that are common are persistence, which is like a good way to handle fr uh, frustration usually is like keep working at whatever's frustrating you. Um, aggression, not such a healthy reaction to frustration, and then withdrawal, which can actually be the most harmful. And this involves apathy, drugs, um, like self-medicating of any kind. So... Um, the thing about frustration is that, like we said, it can lead to aggression, and aggression are, is defined as actions meant to harm or destroy a person. Um, and so when we look at studies, we find that unemployment is one of the factors correlated highly with murder of uh, women, and that is true when those women are in abusive relationships, so the abuser gets frustrated because they're unemployed, for example, and then they are more likely to displace that anger or take that anger out on their wife who they've been abusing. Um, so if you are a woman in a domestic violence relationship um, and your partner has a difficult time with frustration and usually responds by being aggressive, you're four times more likely to um, be murdered than someone who isn't in that situation. And then the next uh, psychological source of stress is um, change. And change is a source of stress when it involves readjustment in our living circumstances. So like we talked about on the previous slide, moving, getting married, getting fired, any major change, especially when it's unexpected, can be a huge stressor to us. And then another one is pressure. And so pressure is a source of conflict when it involves expectations and demands for behaving in certain ways. Um, time pressure is the most common form of pressure um, causing stress, so uh, having deadlines for homework or for work. And so um, studies actually do show, however, that pressure decreases creativity. So if you are a business owner and you're trying to get your employees to be creative, then if possible, um, the ideal situation would be to, to try to not put pressure on them or um, time deadlines that are very strict. And then the next psychological source of stress is uncontrollability. And this is having no degree of control over a situation or a particular event. And having control makes us less stressed. It makes us feel safer in our environment, like we can predict what's going to happen. Um, and so one of the major components of uncontrollability is uh, feeling like you can't predict an outcome. And so this is uh, one of the reasons that police officers experience high levels of stress because they are always dealing with unpredictable situations. They don't know if the person they just pulled over has a gun on them or some other weapon or is going to run or what they're going to do. So um, this creates a feeling of uncontrollability which then can lead to stress. And then the next uh, source of stress we're going to talk about is internal conflict. Internal conflict is a source of stress that occurs when two or more incompatible motivations or behavioral impulses compete for expression. 
Um, so when you're kind of internally struggling between making two decisions. And so there's um, three major different kind of situations in which um, we are faced with these internal conflicts. And the first is approach-approach. And this is a conflict that occurs when a person has to choose between two desirable goals. So um, these ones are like a win-win. They're pretty easy to resolve and not very stressful, but still can bring about some stress. Um, so it's like, do you want to choose this job, which is great and pays a lot, or do you want to choose this job, which is great and pays a lot? And then another internal conflict is avoidance, avoidance. And this is conflict that occurs when a person has to choose between two undesirable goals. So it's kind of a lose-lose situation when you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, and so these ones are definitely more stressful. Um, like if you are suffering from back pain, do you want to take opiates for the rest of your life or do you want to get surgery? Neither option really sounds that great. And then the last one is approach avoidance, and this is conflict that occurs when a person must choose or not choose a goal that has both positive and negative aspects. So in this situation, there's only one goal, and that one goal has both pros and cons, and this is the most stressful of all conflicts. So kind of the go-to example of approach avoidance conflict is marriage. Uh, marriage has both pros and cons. Um, and so you have to kind of look at that situation and decide if the pros outweigh the cons or vice versa and make your decision based on that. Okay, so for our first lecture activity uh, for this chapter, I would like for you to tell me which of these three types of internal conflict you have had before and give me an example. Um, so if you could do that in a minimum of three sentences, that would be great. So lecture activity one, tell me um, about a time you experienced one of these three um, internal conflicts. Okay, so there are some effects of stress, um, most of which are kind of dependent on what's going on in the body when we are stressed. And so what we need to know is that when we are stressed, we go into what's called the fight or flight response. And this is when the body goes on alert status and is ready for aggressive action to meet a threatening situation. So it's really our first reaction to stress. It's usually biological because the body is preparing to defend itself. Um, our bodies don't know the difference between if a lion is running after us um, or if our friend called us a mean name. Um, so we're going to have a stress reaction physically. Uh, regardless, and that reaction is going to prepare us to either fight with the lion or run from the lion. So that's how we get the fight or flight. Um, and so when we go into this fight or flight, um, hormones are released that increase our heart rate, blood pressure, and blood sugar, and hormones like noradrenaline are released to lessen pain sensitivity so that we're kind of at our physical best so that we can um, ensure our safety and, and kind of save our own lives and survive. Um, but the body can't stay in this defense mode forever, so continued stress will weaken the bodily functioning. And a weak body makes us more susceptible to disease, deterioration of body tissue, um, colds, flus, etc. And so uh, there's also something called psychosomatic illness. And this is a physical illness that is largely caused by psychological factors such as stress. And so physical symptoms of psychosomatic illness can include high blood pressure, weak immune system, headaches, fatigue. And then psychological symptoms include an inability to concentrate, heightened irritability, and in severe cases, even disorientation and loss of touch with reality. So... Um, stressors can be very dangerous to us both physically and mentally, so let's go ahead and watch a video now on the effects of stress. Cramming for a test? Trying to get more done than you have time to do? Stress is a feeling we all experience when we are challenged or overwhelmed. But more than just an emotion, stress is a hardwired physical response that travels throughout your entire body. In the short term, stress can be advantageous, but when activated too often or too long, your primitive fight-or-flight stress response not only changes your brain, 
but also damages many of the other organs and cells throughout your body. Your adrenal gland releases the stress hormones cortisol, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, and norepinephrine. As these hormones travel through your bloodstream, they easily reach your blood vessels and heart. Adrenaline causes your heart to beat faster and raises your blood pressure, over time causing hypertension. Cortisol can also cause the endothelium, or inner lining of blood vessels, to not function normally. Scientists now know that this is an early step in triggering the process of atherosclerosis, or cholesterol plaque buildup in your arteries. Together, these changes increase your chances of a heart attack or stroke. When your brain senses stress, it activates your autonomic nervous system. Through this network of nerve connections, your big brain communicates stress to your enteric or intestinal nervous system. Besides causing butterflies in your stomach, this brain-gut connection can disturb the natural rhythmic contractions that move food through your gut, leading to irritable bowel syndrome, and can increase your gut sensitivity to acid, making you more likely to feel heartburn. Via the gut's nervous system, stress can also change the composition and function of your gut bacteria, which may affect your digestive and overall health. Speaking of digestion, does chronic stress affect your waistline? Well, yes. Cortisol can increase your appetite. It tells your body to replenish your energy stores with energy-dense foods and carbs, causing you to crave comfort foods. High levels of cortisol can also cause you to put on those extra calories as visceral or deep belly fat. This type of fat doesn't just make it harder to button your pants. It is an organ that actively releases hormones and immune system chemicals, called cytokines, that can increase your risk of developing chronic diseases, such as heart disease and insulin resistance. Meanwhile, stress hormones affect immune cells in a variety of ways. Initially, they help prepare to fight invaders and heal after injury, but chronic stress can dampen the function of some immune cells, make you more susceptible to infections, and slow the rate you heal. Want to live a long life? You may have to curb your chronic stress. That's because it has even been associated with shortened telomeres, the shoelace tip ends of chromosomes that measure a cell's age. Telomeres cap chromosomes to allow DNA to get copied every time a cell divides without damaging the cell's genetic code, and they shorten with each cell division. When telomeres become too short, a cell can no longer divide, and it dies. As if all that weren't enough, chronic stress has even more ways it can sabotage your health, including acne, hair loss, sexual dysfunction, headaches, muscle tension, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, and irritability. So, what does all this mean for you? Your life will always be filled with stressful situations, but what matters to your brain and entire body is how you respond to that stress. If you can view those situations as challenges you can control and master, rather than as threats that are insurmountable, you will perform better in the short run and stay healthy in the long run. The two leading causes of death in our country are heart disease and cancer. Um, and so when we look at what causes heart disease and cancer, there's obviously a lot of kind of environmental factors, diet, lack of exercise, genetics, things like that. But there's also um, the impact of like your behavior patterns. For example, you can have a type A beha behavior pattern, which is a cluster of behaviors that involve hostility, competitiveness, time urgency, and feeling driven. So type A behavior pattern people are usually kind of identified as workaholics. They can be hostile in, ver in verbal and nonverbal behavior. Um, they can have a hard time relaxing. They're kind of always moving around, trying to do several things at once. Generally, they're very ambitious. Um, they're kind of obsessed with efficiency and hate to waste time, and they're easily annoyed. 
Um, many of them are very successful, but because of this like constant drivenness, they're rarely satisfied. On the other end of the spectrum are type B behavior pattern people. And these um, people demonstrate behaviors that are really patient, cooperative, and kind of non-competitive. They tend to be easygoing, cheerful, relaxed, slow to anger, and at peace. So when we study people that live into their 90s or older, they're usually type B people. So some of the explanations for that are that type A people are more likely to develop heart disease and have heart attacks than type B people, and this is especially true of men. In fact, type A behavior patterns predict heart problems as much as age, blood pressure, smoking, cholesterol, and one of the major reasons for this is actually because of that characteristic of type A behavior, um, which we talked about earlier, hostility. So hostility is the factor that's most linked to heart disease, more than competition or time urgency. And hostility is so toxic because it produces an exaggerated bodily response. So you get increased hormones, blood pressure, and heart rate. You're kind of more in that fight or flight um, response for a longer amount of time, which is detrimental to your body. And then um, evidence suggests that cancer patients emotional state actually affects the disease course. So the more stressed out you are, the harder it is to, to kind of beat um, cancer. And in fact, studies have shown that um, if you have like a positive outlook, an optimistic outlook, it actually leads to the creation of what are called killer cells in your body. And um, killer cells control the size and spread of cancer. So in one uh, piece of research, that took 10 years to conduct. Um, the researchers found that cancer patients' uh, emotional state really does affect the disease course, in part because of those killer cells that we were talking about. So they took women that had had a mastectomy, um, and they were asked kind of questions that would reveal their psychological state. So three months after, uh, you know, they had breast cancer and they got their breasts removed, and so that's a, a mastectomy, um, they were asked um, kind of what they thought the future was going to look like and if they thought they were going to survive or not because uh, just because you, you know, have a mastectomy doesn't necessarily mean the cancer is gone. It could still come back. So what they found was that um, people were kind of put into four categories based on how they responded to questions about their psychological state. So there were the people that stoically accepted their fate um, basically we're just saying like I'm going to die from cancer and I accept that uh, hopelessness people who were upset that they were going to that uh, upset and thought that they were going to die and those people actually had the lowest survival rate so they were um, they had the most people that died after 10 years and then the people that had the highest survival rates meaning that most of them were alive after 10 years had um, what was considered to be a fighting spirit. So they believed that they would overcome the disease and they even began to take steps to prevent reoccurrence. And then there were people that were in denial and just said that the removal of the breast was preventative and they, they didn't have cancer ever, actually. Um, and so based on kind of their psychological state and what they anticipated would happen as a result of um, this mastectomy and the cancer, um, was really kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that ultimately it did seem to impact what actually happened to them. So now we're going to watch a video on um, if stress can actually kill us or not. How detrimental is it? In a busy world with unending work and responsibilities piling up, stress can get to the best of us. But how bad is it for you, really? Can stress actually kill you? From a biological perspective, stress makes perfect sense. If you're about to get chomped on by a bear, your stress hormones better kick your butt into gear. But it turns out that your mortgage, unemployment, and looming exam all trigger the same stress response in your body. And unlike most animals, which eventually experience a major decrease in these hormones, humans can't seem to find the off switch. Even though it's not life and death, our psychological woes consistently bathe our bodies in these hormones, making our heart pound, muscles tense, and stomach turn. Turn. In Japan, they have the term koroshi, which literally translates to death from overwork. 
In what is now deemed an overworking epidemic, these individuals who are seemingly healthy and in their prime suddenly die. After being officially recognized and documented in Japan, these sudden heart attacks and strokes were quickly linked to stress. But how does stress cause this? Cortisol is one of the main stress hormones which helps divert energy to where you need it and away from non-essential functions of the body. But with chronic stress exposure, problems arise. The immune system shuts down, inflammation is inhibited, white blood cells are reduced, and susceptibility to disease increases. Some evidence also suggests that prolonged stress may be involved in the development of cancer. When looking at the arteries of macaque monkeys, those under significant stress have more clogged arteries. This prevents blood from getting to the heart quickly during stress and can ultimately lead to heart attacks. The brain also takes a toll. When looking at mice exposed to stress, we see dramatically smaller brain cells with fewer branch extensions than normal mice. This is particularly prevalent in the areas associated with memory and learning, which may stir up some memories for you of those wonderful all-night study sessions. The acute stress and sleep deprivation can make it increasingly difficult to remember the things we want to. Perhaps the most telling story is in our DNA. We contain something called telomeres at the end of our chromosomes, which decrease in size with our age. Our video on aging here explains this process. Eventually, the telomeres run out, at which point the cell stops duplicating and dies. So telomeres are directly related to aging and length of life. And it turns out, stress may actually accelerate the shortening of these telomeres. But not all hope is lost for the perpetually stressed. Another hormone, oxytocin, has been shown to reduce this stress response. It helps your blood vessels relax and even regenerates the heart from stress-related damage. So how do we get more oxytocin? It's sometimes dubbed the cuddle hormone because it's released during positive social interactions and while caring for others. People who spend more time with others create a buffer or resilience to stress. So when life gets the best of you, just remember, you don't have to go it alone. Spend some time with those you love. It may just save your life. Got a burning question you want answered? Ask it in the comments or on Facebook and Twitter. And if you want the inside scoop on upcoming episode ideas and behind the scenes, check out our personal Instagram and Twitter handles. And subscribe for more weekly science videos. So there's two kind of personality types that are really great at coping with stress. And those are people that are resilient and people that have what we call a hardy personality. And so resilience is defined as the capacity of individuals to bounce back from major stress events with minimal negative effects. So they have a strong ability to withstand, overcome, and thrive after adversity. What we mean by adversity could be anything like death of a loved one, paralysis, permanent injury. And so your degree of resilience really affects your psychological recovery. So the more resilient you are, the faster you recover psychologically. And what we know about resilient people is that they generally are easygoing, good-natured, and have good social skills. Um, so they're kind of more likely to be type B. And they are independent and optimistic. And then people that demonstrate hardiness or have the hardy personality have a personality pattern characterized by an appetite for challenge, a sense of commitment, and a strong sense of being in control of one's life. And these people are associated with a lower rate of stress-related illness, and they're the most successful at coping with stress. And so those three components that we just mentioned, for example, challenge, means that they view change as an opportunity for growth. So they don't look at change as a threat, but rather as an incentive um, to try something new, to have a new adventure, and to grow as a person. And then the other component is commitment. And commitment um, is really kind of defined as throwing yourself into your goals, believing in yourself, and having a clear sense of values in this context. Um, so people that have the hardy personality, they really commit to their goals, and they believe that their activities are important and meaningful. And then the last component of a hardy personality is control. And so um, people that have the hardy personality tend to have what we call an internal locus of control, which means that they believe they are responsible for their successes and failures. So they believe that they can influence events and they are in charge of their reactions to events and to stress. As opposed to people that have an external locus of control, which are people that generally, generally kind of um, look to blame external factors for their failures. The problem with this is that when you, when you do that, it really makes you not in control of the situation at all. And that creates 
more stress. All right, for lecture activity two, I would like for you to tell me about a person that you know, either personally or a popular figure from the media, um, that represents this quality of hardiness or represents the quality of resilience and why you think they uh, have those qualities. Maybe give me an example or list the qualities that they have. So if you could write two to three sentences on that, that would constitute lecture activity two. Okay, so some ineffective reactions to stress are burnout, defensive coping, and drugs and alcohol. So burnout is a state of physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual exhaustion characterized by feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. And when someone is experiencing burnout, they generally have negative changes in their thought and emotions and behaviors. And these negative changes are really a result of prolonged stress or frustration. So people that are burnt out tend to be extremely dissatisfied, pessimistic, they have lower job satisfaction, and generally they have a desire to quit doing whatever it is that they're doing. So we do see it in employees, and we also see it in college students. Um, so one of the things that researchers have found is successful in combating burnout is joining social groups within the organization or the school and um, trying to kind of rediscover motivation. Another way to um, avoid burnout is to engage in what positive psychologist Tal Ben-Shahar uh, calls multi-level recovery. And this is recovery from stress um, that includes recovering at three levels, the micro level, the mid-level, and the macro level. So the micro level um, means regularly taking breaks while you're working, to meditate, exercise, nap, read a book, listen to music. And at the mid-level, this means getting adequate sleep at night, eating, taking proper care of yourself. And then at the macro level, Ben Shahar recommends that we take vacations one to four weeks each year um, is what he says are effective ways of kind of um, avoiding burnout. And then uh, defensive coping is an ineffective reaction to stress. So defensive coping is uh, using defense mechanisms like we talked about in a previous chapter, uh, denial, projection, things like that to kind of lie to ourselves to avoid dealing with the anxiety. And these are usually the least effective um, methods of dealing with stress because they result in postponing dealing with the situation, which can actually make the stress or the problem worse. Um, and so the last way of uh, reacting to stress that is harmful is using drugs and alcohol. Um, so again, drugs and alcohol don't fix anything. They're not a solution. They just kind of... Uh, oftentimes cause us to feel worse afterwards um, and then the problem's still there and if we've avoided it too long it may have compounded or become more of a difficult challenge. Um, so these are all ineffective reactions to stress. And one of the most severe things that can result as a consequence to stress is PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder and this is an anxiety disorder resulting from a traumatic event and characterized by symptoms of re-experiencing the trauma, avoidance, numbing, um, and hyperarousal. So these long-lasting effects can include re-experiencing the event in vivid flashbacks or dreams. Um, in fact, an episode of PTSD can be triggered just by a loud noise. Um, and so it is common to see people with PTSD have anger issues or just be completely emotionally numb. Um, it can be difficult for people with PTSD to maintain relationships. Um, it's common to see uh, sleep disorders like insomnia in people with PTSD. And then very commonly we see drug and alcohol use associated with um, PTSD. So currently we know that PTSD affects at least 2.2% of the American population or 7.7 .7 million people. However, um, especially people that are suffering from an episode of PTSD because they were in the military or something like that often do not seek treatment 
um, because it's kind of sometimes looked at as weak or vulnerable, which is the complete opposite of how they've been trained to um, kind of survive and live in war. Um, so we know that 66% of people with PTSD do not seek treatment. 20% of veterans from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars report PTSD. But outside of veterans, uh, there are numbers that say 55% of people will experience a traumatic event at some point in their life. 10% um, of females will experience PTSD and 5% of males will experience PTSD. And so um, PTSD can come from, of course, the things that, you know, a veteran sees in war and deals with, but also people that have been victims of assault um, or any type of very catastrophic, damaging, scary, unexpected situation. Um, in fact, sexual exploitation in any form is um, commonly associated with PTSD. And so um, child sexual abuse is, is very commonly associated with PTSD. And this is defined as the sexual victimization of a child by an adult or a significantly older child. Um, what's interesting about child sexual abuse is that it's usually about power and control and not as much about sex. It's almost always by someone the victim knows and um, these people will use punishments and threats more than they will use physical violence um, in order to abuse the child. Incest is a form of sexual abuse that involves any form of inappropriate sexual behavior that is brought about by coercion or deception between two people that are related, such as a parent, an aunt, an uncle, grandparent, brother, or sister. And so... Uh, Pedophilia is a word that is uh, associated with child sexual abuse, and it is a person that suffers from a disorder where they have uncontrollable sexual compulsions involving children. Um, and then child molest molestation is any sexual act performed with a child by an adult um, or much older child. Um, so when we look at incest and childhood sexual abuse, um, one of the things that researchers want to know is who are the abusers. And so only 7% of cases happen with someone the victim does not know, which means 93% of cases are um, involving someone the victim knows. Abusers are usually shy and victims of child sex abuse themselves. Um, they're usually attracted to children of either gender, um, and they fear adult intimate relationships. It's common to see abusers suffer from anxiety and depression, live alone with their parents, abuse drugs. Usually they're unemployed or work in very low-paying jobs. And they often engage in other atypical sexual behaviors like exhibitionism or sadomasochism. Um, some may demonstrate deeply moralistic or religious beliefs. And it's very common that abusers have more than one Victim. There have been studies that show abusers with up to a hundred or more victims. So research shows that for most people, the effects of childhood sexual abuse last their whole life. Um, and so some of the effects include emotional distress, characterized by being haunted into adulthood with thoughts that it's their fault they were abused, um, they didn't report it so no one rescued them, or perhaps that they enjoyed it in some way. They see themselves as damaged goods, as being bad, immoral, or sexually perverted. And since they often see themselves as not worthy of love, many of the survivors end up in abusive relationships as adults. Um, and then distress increases the longer they keep it a secret. So the longer they don't tell anyone, the longer they suffer the effects of distress. Um, generally, the average victim will wait about 14 years after the abuse ends to tell anyone. And so common emotional problems that we see in adulthood of victims of childhood sexual abuse are anger, poor self-esteem, self-blame, shame, guilt, isolation, and loneliness. And then psychological disorder uh, disorders associated with childhood sexual abuse include um, depression, obviously PTSD, self-destructive behavior, anxiety disorders, dissociation, suicidal behaviors, learning disabilities. Um, and so the problem with 
I mean, there are many problems with childhood sexual abuse, obviously. Um, but one of the problems is that it robs its victims of feeling a personal sense of power, feeling in control of their life and their body. And as we talked about before, control is a really important part of uh, managing stress. And so, unfortunately, the victims of childhood sexual abuse often feel out of control um, for the majority of their lives. Um, unless, of course, they seek treatment, in which case we've seen amazing outcomes from that. Another type of sexual exploitation is rape, and rape is defined as physically or psychologically forcing sexual relations on another person. Um, acquaintance rape is defined as your in your book as a sexual assault committed by someone the victim knows, such as a friend or a date. A 2009 study found there were 240 rapes per day in the United States of America. And approximately 20% of women are raped at some point in their lifetime. Like we said, most rapes occur with a person the victim knows. Uh, many researchers believe rape is less about sexual desire and more about power, control, humiliation, anger, and violence. Um, most rapes involve a male rapist and a female victim, but there are cases of male-on-male -male rape and female rapist male victim situations. However, studies show that women think about and try to prevent being sexually assaulted way more than men do. Um, many women say they would rather actually be murdered than raped. Um, and in terms of uh, male victim rape, 3% of men report being raped or having been attempted to be raped. But these numbers are probably low due to underreporting. Usually, male victim rapes are committed by other men. Um, 40% of women that are raped are between the ages of 12 and 24 years old. And then another kind of rape is date rape. And uh, date rape is forced and unwanted intercourse with someone in the context of dating. Um, date rape drugs are often used uh, to kind of um, allow or assist in the date rape itself. So date rape Rape drugs are powerful sedatives that render a rapist potential victim unconscious or otherwise unable to resist. And alcohol use by the perpetrator or the victim is involved in the majority of college date rape situations. And the last type of sexual exploitation that we're going to talk about that um, usually results in stress is sexual harassment. So sexual harassment is unwel unwelcome sexual advances, gestures, requests for sexual favors, and any other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature in the workplace or in the academic setting. So compared to the previous types of sexual aggression discussed, this may seem mild, but studies show it can be extremely traumatic for some people. Um, and so we see sexual harassment happen in different settings. It's not always between a superior and a subordinate in that kind of power dy dynamic, like boss-employee. It can also happen between peers. Um, it even happens in schools, K through 12 schools. So studies show that kids harass other kids. 80% of teen boys and girls report being sexually harassed on a daily basis by their peers. 29% of 6th graders report being harassed in the last 90 days. And sexual harassment, especially in um, school situations, includes sexual graffiti, um, like writing things that are sexually explicit about uh, one of your peers at school on the bathroom walls or something. Sexual teasing, intimidation, spreading rumors about the person that are sexual in nature. Um, sexual verbal taunting, unwanted touching, and assault and rape. So of the effect of victims is psycho the effect on victims is psychological, emotional, it affects physical health and then it also affects um, academic performance. In college, 60% of students report being sexually harassed. Most colleges have policies that prevent professors from engaging in sexual relationships with students. Uh, and this is a controversial topic because some people say as long as the adults are consenting, it's not really a problem. But the problem is, is that there is that superior subordinate power dynamic there. Um, is it really consensual when a professor has a power over your grade? 
class enrollment, letters of recommendation, etc. So victims can still feel pressure, but it's more common amongst peers. Um, so common behaviors that we see in sexual harassment at colleges are um, people waiting outside classrooms, continually asking for a date after refusals, comments about sex or body, um, or any unwanted touching. So the effects of sexual harassment on the victims includes depression, anxiety, poor academic or work performance, poor self-esteem, substance abuse, and absenteeism. All right, so we've talked about a lot of different situations that can bring about stress. And la now let's talk about some uh, constructive responses to stress. So constructive coping is relatively helpful behavior reactions to stress. And there are two major categories. There is emotion-focused coping, and there is problem-focused coping. So emotion-focused coping is when people try to manage the emotions in the face of the stress by trying to change the way they feel or perceive the problem. Examples of this could be accepting sympathy from others, or looking on the bright side, or looking at the stressful situation as a learning opportunity. And emotion-focused coping is often used most successfully when it's probably not a situation that you're going to be able to change. Um, and so you kind of have to accept that situation, like if you've been fired and it's official. Um, so instead of kind of uh, trying to solve a problem in that situation, you can accept that this has happened and try to look at it as a learning opportunity. However, if you do think you can change a situation, then you can use problem-focused coping, which is where you try to modify the stressful problem or the source of stress by developing a plan of action. So, for example, if you're stressed about bad grades, you can start a study group. Um, if you're stressed about work, you can uh, talk to your boss about ways to kind of manage that stress or different uh, tasks that you can do at work that might be more meaningful or more productive or different situations that might uh, that you could put yourself in that might alleviate some of the stress working different hours or working with different people um, and then other great ways to respond to stress are social support um, which involves a mutual network of caring interested others that help us cope with stress this can be friends family sports teams uh, religious groups. In fact, studies show that healthy people that attend religious services regularly have lower death rates than healthy people that do not. And researchers believe this is because of the social support that they get through their church. Um, and then we've seen brain activity in the area associated with stress be reduced. Um, just when we ask people that say they're stressed to hold hands with one another, we see that the stress areas in the brain kind of go down. Um, and so another thing you can do to cope with stress in a healthy way is to turn a threat into a challenge. Um, for example, if your car keeps breaking down, take an auto mechanic class. Um, you can make a threatening situation less threatening. So if, it's, if the situation seems uncontrollable, you can try changing your attitude or view or perception of the situation. Another thing you can do is change your goals. So uh, if you can't change a situation, you can always try restructuring. For example, um, if a, there was a dancer that lost their legs in a car accident and then became a choreographer instead. Um, you can prepare for stress before it happens. This is called proactive coping. So if you know you have a week of midterms coming up, clear your schedule, get everything you need, um, get prepared, have some fun munchies around the house um, so that you can be ready to just study and prep for that week of midterms. And then another thing you can do is take physical action, which is what we're going to talk about now. A lot of doctors and physicians believe that if you can change the way your body is feeling as a reaction to stress, like if you can lower that flight, fight or flight response, then um, you might in turn feel less stress or experience less stress kind of in your mind. Um, so stress reduction techniques that are physical are kind of attempting to deal with the way the body is reacting to the stress first, and then hopefully that will change the way your mind is reacting to the stress. So um, there's a couple different deep relaxation techniques that you can use to reduce physical and psychological fatigue caused by stress. The first one is deep breathing. So with deep breathing, you want to put one hand on your stomach so that you can feel your diaphragm um, rise and fall 
as you breathe in and breathe out. So the technique involves breathing in through your nose for a count of seven seconds and then holding your breath for five to ten seconds and then exhaling through your mouth for seven seconds and you want your exhalation to be audible. You want to hear yourself breathing out and your stomach should be pushing your hand up as you breathe in and down as you breathe out. And then another type of uh, deep relaxation techniques is um, progressive muscular relaxation. And this is a technique that involves tensing and relaxing each muscle group individually. And so you can do this uh, by lying down is kind of the best way to do it. And you just go through each muscle group starting at your head or your feet and working to the top uh, if you start at your feet working to your head and if you're starting at your head working down to your feet and you just go uh, one muscle at a time tensing it and holding for uh, three to five seconds as you inhale and then relax that muscle and breathe out um, as you in it so as you relax the muscle you're exhaling for about three to five seconds so you can start with your face muscles and then move to um, kind of your neck and then from there your shoulders and your chest and then your arms and then uh, your hips and then your butt and then your legs and so on and so forth. And then another method is called guided imagery and guided imagery is where someone describes a relaxing scene to you and you try to experience that scene or visualize that scene using all of your senses. So if a person is telling you to smell something, you try to imagine that smell, feel something, you try to feel that feeling. Okay, so let's give it a shot. Just follow along with what this video is telling you to imagine and give guided imagery a try. Five minute beach guided imagery. Welcome to this five minute beach guided imagery. I'm Julia Mayer, co-author of AARP Meditations for Caregivers. The purpose of this exercise is to transport you to a peaceful place where your body feels relaxed and your mind feels calm. Sit in a comfortable, quiet place, letting your arms fall gently to your sides or placing them on your lap. Or if you prefer, lie on your back, arms at your sides. Close your eyes. Take a big breath in, feeling your body expand deeply. And then slowly exhale. Now through your nose, breathe in again deeply. And then slowly exhale through your mouth. Continue to breathe in and out at a comfortable pace as you imagine yourself at the beach. You are lying comfortably on a plush white beach towel on your back on top of the warm, smooth, firm sand. The sun shines down and warms your body with a gentle breeze blowing by now and then that brings your warm skin just the right amount of cool relief. The sky is a deep blue with a few small puffy white clouds here and there. Look far out in the ocean near the horizon and notice several colorful sailboats. Watch them move slowly along the horizon. Breathe in and smell the salt air and relax as you breathe out. Listen to the songs of birds calling to one another in the distance as they fly over the water. Now focus your attention on the sound of the waves breaking over and over, gentle and soothing coming up toward the beach and then breaking as the water moves over the sand and then retreating as the next wave approaches, breaking and washing away. Waves come up the beach, break gently 
and wash away. As you breathe, the waves continue to break and wash away. You feel relaxed and peaceful, listening to the sound of waves coming up toward the beach and breaking and then washing away. Breaking and washing away. You are aware of the calm, still feeling of quiet and peacefulness inside you. Your mind is focused and joyful. Your body feels warm and relaxed. The feeling of the pleasant heat of the sun and then the gentle breeze on your skin is soothing and relaxing. Your body feels deeply relaxed and heavy against the plush towel over the warm, smooth, firm sand. Your eyelids feel heavy as you listen to the waves breaking and washing away, breaking and washing away. You feel like you could just drift off to sleep in this warm, peaceful spot, listening to the waves breaking and washing away, breaking and washing away. Let yourself be still in this relaxed place for a few moments. When you are ready, take a big breath in and a long, slow breath out. Wiggle your fingers and toes and then slowly open your eyes. Notice that you are feeling calm, relaxed, and refreshed. You have now completed this five-minute beach-guided imagery meditation to help you feel transported in your mind to a peaceful, relaxing place. Any time of the day, know that you can come back to this spot to feel focused, relaxed, and centered. For more inspiration, see our other meditations and our book, Meditations for Caregivers, at aarp.org slash meditations for caregivers. All right, for lecture activity three, I would like for you to give me your reaction to guided imagery. Did it work for you? Did it make you feel more relaxed or not? Um, what did you like about it? What did you dislike about it? So just give me two or three sentences reacting to your experience with guided imagery for lecture activity three. All right, and the next stress reduction technique is meditation. So in our culture, meditation is um, maybe not taken as seriously as it's taken in other cultures, but there's a big push for it now in um, psychology and in medicine because there are just so many benefits to meditation, both mentally and physically. Um, so meditation is a process of directing our attention to a single, unchanging, repetitive stimulus, and the aim is personal transformation. It's a tool to increase our awareness, become centered, and achieve an internal focus. Um, and so one of the things that uh, we're going to do now is watch a video on the scientific power of meditation and all of the ways it helps. The definition really focuses on the spiritual or psychological ways that meditation helps, but there are some um, other uh, um, benefits to it that are cognitive and physical as well. So let's go ahead and watch the video first, and then after you watch the video, we're going to try meditation. For thousands of years, people have practiced meditation for spiritual, emotional, and physical well-being. But from a scientific perspective, how exactly does meditating affect your body? Does it really do anything? It all starts in the brain. During meditation, brain scans see increased activity in regions directly correlated with decreased anxiety and depression, along with increased pain tolerance. The default mode network, in particular, is activated when one's mind is at rest and not focusing on the outside world, and has been found to improve memory, self-awareness, and goal setting. Want to be more caring to your friends and family? When scientists compared the brains of Buddhist monks to new meditators, they found the region of the brain associated with empathy to be much more pronounced in the monks. It also literally changes your brainwave 
waves, and we can measure these frequencies. Meditators have higher levels of alpha waves, which have been shown to reduce feelings of negative mood, tension, sadness, and anger. And if that wasn't enough, it also physically changes our brain shape and size. Studies found that after eight weeks of a meditation program, gray matter was more dense in areas associated with learning, memory processing, and emotion regulation. And yet the amygdala, which deals with stress, blood pressure, and fear, had decreased gray matter. When we look at the entire body, not only do we see decreased blood pressure, but it can also increase the variability of your heart rate. And while this may sound harmful, it actually plays a critical role in properly transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide throughout your body. Body. Think you're getting sick? In a study where both meditators and non-meditators were given the flu virus, meditators were able to produce a greater number of antibodies and had increased immune function. If we go a little deeper, we can even see changes on a cellular level. Your chromosomes have protective protein complexes called telomeres, which help reduce damage to your DNA and lower cell death. And a shortened telomere length has been linked to several diseases such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and cancer. Amazingly, when cancer survivors completed a meditation program, their bodies showed significant increases in telomere length. It's believed that psychological intervention, particularly decreasing stress, has a direct effect on the enzyme telomerase, which has been shown to counteract shortening by adding DNA to the shrinking telomeres. Of course, meditation is not a substitute for other medical advice or a healthy lifestyle. We don't want you leaving this video thinking it will cure cancer. But much like hitting the gym can grow your muscles and increase your overall health, it seems that meditation may be a way of working out your brain with extra health benefits. And since your brain controls, well, all of you, why not relax and say, um, every once in a while. And if you like working out your brain, be sure to get our ASAP Science book, which is now available for pre-sale at asapscience.com book. We've got answers to your most asked burning questions, persistent rumors, and unexplained phenomenon. Whether you're a huge science fan or just a curious mind, the book has something for everyone, and we're so excited for you to read it and show off your newfound knowledge to all your friends. Thanks again for all the support through the years, helping us share a love of science with the world. And subscribe for more weekly science videos. Okay, so now we're going to give meditation a shot. And basically, the first thing you need to do is pick a focal point, um, something to give your mind uh, a, a spot to pay attention to. This can be a word, a body part, a picture, a flame. It doesn't matter. Um, the mantra is what is often associated with having a focal point that's a word and the mantra can be anything if you are a religious or spiritual person you could make the mantra a word associated with your spiritual or religious beliefs like god or or uh, whatever you would like or if you're not a spiritual or religious person um it doesn't really matter what the word is to be honest it could be tacos if you want um you just need something for your brain to focus on and so you're going to repeat the mantra in time with your breathing. So as you sit, breathe in, you'll say your mantra in your head. And then as you breathe out, you'll say your mantra in your head. And so you're going to want to close your eyes, sit up straight, concentrate all your energy on this exercise, try to relax your muscles, breathe normally in through your nose and out through your mouth, and then in your mind, repeat your mantra silently over and over you want to try to just focus on your mantra. So if any thoughts come in, um, you want to just kind of let them pass through like this picture of the clouds that you see on the slide. Rather than trying to stop them, um, you want to just let them throw, uh, float through. Some people say it's good to acknowledge them. Hello, thought. There you are. And then just go back to repeating your mantra. If you focus too much on trying to stop them, then you're focusing on that rather than your mantra. So let's uh, give meditation a shot. I welcome you with love, my friend. This is a quick guided meditation to calm your mind. Please sit or lie down in a comfortable position. Relax every muscle in your body. Close your eyes. Let your attention rest on your breathing. There is nothing else, only your breaths. 
breathing in and breathing out in Right now, only your breathing is real. Allow thoughts to float by. In this moment, they are not real. It is only you and your breath. For the next couple of minutes, Rest your attention on your breathing, allowing thoughts to float by. When you are ready, start moving your muscles. Feel your body's weight on the ground. Take a deep breath in, and as you exhale slowly, open your eyes. Welcome the world with this new calm mind. Love and light to you, my friend. Okay, for lecture activity four, I would just like for you to tell me your experience with meditation. Um, did you feel anything weird in your body? Uh, were you able to keep thoughts from coming in? Did you have a hard time focusing on your mantra? Uh, what was the experience like for you? Do you feel more relaxed? Some people feel more stressed out after meditation. So just tell me your experience of it in like two to three sentences. Okay, another stress reduction technique is um, kind of like more a way of living than it is a technique that is like an isolated event you do like how meditation is um so mindfulness is almost more a way of life but anyways it's clearing our mind and calming our body to keep focused on what is in the here and now rather than focusing on the what if 
And so the purpose is to try to experience each moment fully, and it involves paying attention to the here and now very actively. And the idea behind it is that we can make moments wonderful if we stop running into the future or worrying about the past and being focused on material things, but instead just stay in this present moment. So um, let's go ahead and watch a video on mindfulness and how to do it as kind of a way of life. Mindfulness is the broad term used for bringing our attention to the present moment in an open, kind and non-judgmental way. It is simply a skill, a way of seeing and a way of being that can allow us to engage more fully with our life, bringing us less stress and more happiness. This skill of mindfulness can be developed in two ways, formally through meditation practices or informally by simply aligning our thoughts with our behaviours in everyday life. For example, giving your full attention to a person during conversation, or observing the experience of making a cup of tea instead of getting caught up in thoughts, essentially stopping to smell the roses. Both methods of practice are beneficial and will support you to live with a greater degree of calm, clarity and connection. The opposite of mindfulness is mindlessness or autopilot, kind of like taking the back seat and letting your thoughts and emotions drive your decisions and actions. Mindfulness works because it allows us to step out of our autopilot mode and get into the driver's seat. So instead of reacting, thinking in circles or repeating old habits, we are able to respond to the events in life with greater empowerment and choice. We can all build our mindfulness muscle, like a workout for the mind. You've perhaps glimpsed it when engaging in an activity we love, where we feel completely immersed in the moment. For example, whilst running, swimming, cooking, painting or playing an instrument, where our mind becomes calm and clear. Mindfulness is a tool that can allow us to bring this calm and clear perspective to all of our moments. It helps to create space between us and our thoughts. It allows us to notice our thoughts, emotions and our surroundings and choose what we attach ourselves to and what we let pass by like clouds in the sky floating by. Over time, this can allow us to be less stressed, less reactive and more focused and connected. This program will provide you with some formal and informal tools to guide you in building your mindfulness muscle. Sitting down to meditate is important for training your brain. With time, the real magic will happen in the typical everyday moments of your life. Whether you're chopping carrots, settling your crying baby or responding to emails. By bringing an open awareness to your situation, you are more likely to truly experience this journey of parenting rather than just reading the roadmap. Mindfulness will support you to embrace the sticky, messy and lovely parts of being a parent with an open mind and an open heart. So don't wait for the right time to sit down and practice this new skill. Start now, in this very moment. As you sit here, tune into your mind. Take a sneak peek into what it's up to. Is it clear, calm and still? Are you really here in this moment? Or is it stormy with mental chatter? Perhaps worries or planning? Reflect on how your mind is serving you and then realise you are not at the mercy of your thoughts and emotions. By being mindful and present, you can choose to switch off your autopilot, grab the steering wheel of life and enjoy the colourful, rich an exciting journey ahead. So now we're going to go over some stress reduction techniques that are maybe a little more active on your physical body's part. So the first uh, technique that you can do is yoga. 
And yoga is defined by your book as a way of life that involves practice of certain mental states and physical stretching um, exercises that enable us to use the strengths we already have and build on them. And yoga has been associated with a decrease in problems like arthritis, back pain, digestive disorders, insomnia, diabetes, migraines, uh, varicose veins, and obesity. So essentially, yoga is a series of different poses that you do. And um, I've gone to yoga before, and I was surprised at how difficult it is. You're like just standing in a pose, but for some reason, you're sweating profusely. Um, and so what I was taught by my yoga instructor was that it's it shouldn't be a competitive thing, um, but you just want to kind of do each pose to your best ability. And if you can't do the full pose, then it's okay to make adjustments and kind of just do your best at the pose. Um, so if you can't get your arm all the way up in the air, you can only get it halfway up in the air. That's just as great. Um, and it's very important that while you do yoga, you remember to breathe. I have seen lots of people in yoga forget to breathe and be holding a pose and just uh, pass out. So breathe, stretch, don't strain yourself. If you feel anything ripping, tearing, or burning, you're going to want to stop or relax a little. Um, so let's go ahead and give yoga a shot. So clear a space in your room or wherever you are and uh, follow along with this video of a yoga instructor teaching some basic poses. Um, and don't push yourself too hard. All right, my darling friends, let's begin with cat-cow. Come into tabletop position, and we'll start to move with the breath. Inhale, drop the belly, open the chest, nice and slow. Exhale, round through, chin to chest. Inhale, open the chest, feel the front body stretch. And exhale. Rounding through, navel draws up. Couple more here, move with your breath, nice and slow, waking up the body, setting a mindful tone for the day. One more cow pose, drop the belly, this time really tug the shoulders away from the ears and press into the feet firmly. And then one more cat pose. Really arch the spine and claw to the fingertips. Chin to chest. Great work. Inhale, tabletop. This time bump, bump the hips to the left and then turn to look past your right shoulder. Feel a nice stretch in the side body. Keep the hands and feet rooted to the earth. And then slowly, gently come through center. Bump the hips to the right and turn to look past your left shoulder. Again, keep the hands and feet grounded. Continue to breathe here as we slowly wake up the body with love. Back to center we go. Drop the elbows right where the hands are. Take a deep breath in. And then on your exhale, slowly walk the knees back. Puppy posture or heart to earth pose, a beautiful way to kick off the day. Nice chest opener here. Breathe deep, opening the shoulders. We get the head just under the heart here. Welcoming some fresh oxygen, fresh blood flow. And then slowly come all the way back up to tabletop position. Again, take your time. Then we'll curl the toes under. Take a deep breath in. And on your exhale, send the hips up high, downward facing dog. Pedal it out nice and easy. Start to deepen your breath. Shake the head loose. Give thanks for your body. And appreciate yourself for taking this moment to do a quick check-in to move it around. When you're ready, walk the feet to the middle of the mat. Bend the knees, come into forward fold. Again, we're letting the blood flow opposite direction here. Shake the head loose, relax through your shoulders. 
Really feel your feet grounded to the earth here. And again, connect to a little gratitude. Definitely appreciate yourself. Smile. And you should feel good, happy, proud that you took this time to connect to your body, give it some love, connect to your breath. All right, bend the knees generously, bring the belly to the tops of the thighs. And when you're ready, we'll slowly roll it up. Nice and slow, feel your feet press into the earth. Grounding in this moment for yourself as you slowly rise up to mountain pose. When you get there, take a moment to move the shoulders a little bit, just soft, easy movement. Continue to deepen the breath. And then see if you can feel it out and align your head over your heart, your heart over the pelvis as you either bring the feet together, really together, or you can choose to go hip width apart. Just nice mindful footing. And really feel like you're pressing away from the earth as we spread the fingertips. And this is that big good morning stretch. Reach your fingertips all the way up towards the sky. Take a deep breath in. Stretch, stretch, stretch. Really maximize the stretch here. Give it your all. Feel it out. Notice what it feels like to be alive today. Stretch, stretch, stretch even more. And then slowly release, interlace the fingertips behind the back. Knuckles draw down and away. This is our last move here. So draw the shoulder blades together and lift your heart. Open your mind. Take a deep breath in and exhale, ending with a big hug today. Release the arms and give yourself a big hug. And I encourage you to lift your heart. And one last time, really feel your feet pressing away from the earth. Take one final deep breath in. And exhale, mountain pose. Nice work. All right, so for lecture activity five, I would like for you to give me your reaction to yoga. Do you see how this could be a stress reducer? Did you enjoy it? Was it harder than you thought? Um, just tell me about your experience with it in two to three sentences. Is it something you think you might work into your life or uh, whatever you want to tell me about your experience with yoga? Two to three sentences for lecture activity five. Okay, the next stress reduction technique that's kind of more physically active is Pilates. And this involves a series of physical exercises paired with a specific breathing technique to fire the small internal stabilizing muscles to correct muscle imbalances, improve posture, coordination, balance, strength, and flexibility, and increase breathing capacity and organ functioning. I've never done Pilates, but I hear it's similar to yoga, um, but they also have equipment, so um, you can check that out. I, I don't know if we have Pilates on campus at our college, but um, it's widely available through cities, uh, through different uh, gyms that you might be a member of, and then of course there are like Pilates studios um, that often have free trials. And then there is Tai Chi, which exercises the body, mind, and spirit by gently working muscles to enhance concentration and reduce the effects of stress on the body. Um, it's similar to yoga, kind of, in that you go through kind of a series of poses um, or movements. So let's watch a video of a, a man doing chai tea, uh, Tai Chi chi and try to follow along and I'm going to ask you about your experience with it when the video is over. Now I'm going to get into some Tai Chi moves, very easy Tai Chi moves. 
If you get in the habit of doing this on a daily basis, you'll find your balance, your whole posture alignment will become better and you'll also feel good. And that's the most important thing. You want to feel good all the time. You don't want to be waking up with a lot of aches and pains. So if you can, just follow me on this. I'm going to bring my feet together. My hands are resting on a table. All I'm going to do is step with my left leg on an angle, just a little step. I'm going to bring my hands up to my chest, rock forward, push both arms out, let them open slowly and rock back. I'm going to rock forward again, pushing both arms out, open, rock back. I'm going to do one more like that. Normally I do about five or six. And once you're done, you bring your leg in and the hands rest on a table. Same thing on the right side. The hands come up to the chest, step two o'clock, rock forward and rock back. As I rock forward, I try to keep my back foot flat on the ground and my toes come up as I rock back. One more and bring my leg in, rest your hands on a table. The next one is you turn your palms to the left. You step with the left leg to the side and you push the water. Turn the hands over, push in the water. Notice I'm moving in a slow pace, shifting the weight from one leg to the other. The shift is what strengthens the legs. And now I'm going to bring my left leg in and the hands rest on a table. The next move, the palms face each other and I like to keep it about head width apart. You step with the left leg again. You rock, pretend you go over a drum, a round drum and back. This helps your balance and also helps your brain. I'll do one more this way and bring my leg in, rest it on a table. Palms face each other again. I step with the right leg at two o'clock, go over a drum. By the way, I am mirror imaging you. So for those who are analytical, when you use your left, I'm using my right. And now bring your leg in and down. Next move, the palms open. All I do is step out with my left leg and I bring the hands up to form a ball right in front of my face. This is a ball of energy. As I rock back, that energy ball comes down, breaks apart gently, and then you build it up again. This helps the whole meridian system to build up energy. I'll do one more. As I come back, the hands just circle around and rest on a table. The next move, right side, palms open, step with the right leg, same thing. And now I'll bring it into a close and rest the hands on a table. The next move, the hands float up to the shoulders, step with the left leg, and the hands come down to form a ball below the navel. It's a ball of energy. Pick the ball of energy up towards the neck, let it break open softly, and slowly go back, build the energy up again. Bring it up to the neck, break open. Now as the ball comes up, I bring my leg in, turn the hand over, rest a hand on a table. Right side, go down again. I'll do one more this side. Bring your leg in and down. Now, the breathing on this is natural breathing. Don't force it, just let it be a natural form of breath. Every time you move forward, you exhale. Every time you come back, you inhale. But it, there's a lot going on when you're doing this. So just breathe natural, you'll be okay. The next move is called circle of globe. Form a ball. Think of a beach ball. Left hand on top, right hand on bottom. The two palms face each other. Let your knees relax. Step with the left leg to the side and just shift the weight. Now roll the ball over slow. Now if you notice, I'm not going to move my arms. I'm just moving my body the ball will follow. Roll the ball over, just move the body to the left. 
and roll it over and move it to the right and bring the left leg in and down. Next move, the hands float up to the shoulders. Step with the left leg. Slowly push the left arm out. As you come back, push the right arm out. The left arm goes out and the right arm. Left arm again and I'll bring my leg in with that and down. Same thing to the other side. Hands up to the shoulders, step with the right leg. Push the right arm out and now the left. And now bring the right leg in and hands come down. Two more moves I'm showing you. The hands will float up to the chest. Step with the left leg out and push both palms out. It's a beautiful move, very easy to do. Turn the palms over, pull it in. This is a good way to practice your breathing. Exhale as you go out, turn the hands over, inhale coming back. Exhale out, inhale in, and the feet come in and down. Hands float up to the chest again, step with the right leg, exhale and inhale. And now bring your leg in and softly come down. The last move I'm going to show you, I'll show you this way. Put your left hand right here. Put your right hand down here below your belly button. Step with your left leg to the side. Just shift the weight. Switch the hands. Now at this point here, don't move the arms. Just move your body. It's called hands waving clouds or cloud waving. There's many names for this. As you get more experience in this, you can let your, top, your head follow your hand on the top, and that works your neck muscles. This is one of the most popular Tai Chi moves today, is this one here. And now as I shift to the right, bring your left leg in, and the hands come down. To close this, I open my palms, I breathe in, the hands come together. I exhale to the chest. I open it into the lotus flower, the flower of beauty, strength, and purity. I breathe in its strength. As I exhale, I close the flower into two fists. I breathe in and push it out to the universe. As I exhale, I open and I let it go. I come back into prayerful pose. Namaste. All right, so lecture activity six is to tell me um, what you thought about Tai Chi um, when you were following along. How did it feel? Did you like it? You can compare it to the other methods that you've done today and let me know what you think. Um, is it similar? Is it different? Is it better? Is it worse? What's your subjective opinion on it? So just give me two or three sentences on your experience with Tai Chi for lecture activity six. Okay, so another stress reduction technique that's not very physically active, you just lay there, is acupuncture. Um, and this is the insertion of tiny needles into specific acupuncture points located in various places all over the body to relieve pain and bring the body back to a state of balance and health. So I actually recently got acupuncture for the first time, and I'm like not a big fan of needles at all. Um, but it's really, you can barely even feel the needles going in. Um, and so it was an interesting experience. I definitely felt more relaxed after it. My husband goes to acupuncture every two weeks or so and has gotten a lot of um, physical and mental benefits from it. So it's uh, something that's readily available around, uh, I mean, in our country. You can find acupuncture places anywhere. Um, and 
it's a relatively interesting experience if you've never done it. I think it's it's worth a try. Um, but let's watch a video on um, what science says about the effectiveness of acupuncture. Scientifically, when it comes to acupuncture, it's hard to see the point. Hello everyone, Julian here for DNews. Acupuncture is the practice of pricking skin or tissue with fine needles. It's usually used for a form of pain relief, although it's claimed to have a plethora of other benefits. The first definitive description of acupuncture is from China over 2,000 years ago, and at the time, it was believed that illness was caused when life force, known as qi, couldn't properly flow through the body, or when the two forms of qi, yin and yang, were out of balance. Prodding certain points would clear the blockages and restore the flow of qi, causing the illness to subside. Now, if this sounds silly to you, remember that around the same time in the Western world, we had a similar theory about the imbalance of humors, and doctors used to think people were sick because they had just too much of this blood stuff in them and it needed to come out. But while bloodletting went out of style around the same time as child labor, acupuncture has been making a comeback since the 1950s as a tool for pain relief. It's also used to treat depression, irritable bowel syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, smoking addiction, chronic asthma, smoking rehabilitation, epilepsy, insomnia, morning sickness, and glaucoma, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, even color blindness. Sounds amazing if it can do all these things, but so far there's been no plausible mechanism for how this one treatment could accomplish all that. Whether or not acupuncture works is controversial, and part of the problem is that it's inherently difficult to study scientifically. Some factors, like the soothing nature of the acupuncture room, are easy to control for. Just turn up the lights and cut out the careless whisper. But the act of putting in the needle itself causes headaches for researchers. If the researchers know the treatment is a placebo, it can affect their results. So scientists have developed a sort of stealth needle to overcome this problem. It's concealed in a sheath and either goes in all the way or only pokes the surface. The goal is for the patient to believe the needle is in and the researcher won't know one way or the other. But even with these sham needles and with a plethora of research, there is still considerable debate. A 2003 World Health Organization review of multiple acupuncture studies showed oodles of positive results. This review, however, omitted trials where sham acupuncture and the real thing had similar effects. Plus, a majority of the studies were published in Asian journals, and as Andrew Vickers of the Research Council for Complementary Medicine pointed out in a different review of 252 acupuncture studies, all trials originating in China, Japan, Hong Kong, and Taiwan were positive. By comparison, only 53% of reviewed trials in the U.S. favored the treatment. More recent reviews have debunked acupuncture. A 2006 meta-analysis published by the Journal of Internal Medicine found that the results of acupuncture treatment couldn't be differentiated from the placebo. A 2010 meta-analysis of meta-analyses that is so meta in the Journal of the International Association for the Study of Pain concluded there was little evidence supporting acupuncture as an effective form of pain relief. But in 2012, a meta-analysis out of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, authored by that same Vickers guy from earlier, came out in favor of acupuncture, finding it had an effect greater than the placebo, but conceded it was, quote, relatively modest. Now, this is the point where I'd normally conclude that more research is needed, but this time I'm not so sure. There have been over 3,000 trials on acupuncture, and there's still no conclusive evidence that being poked with needles alone reduces pain or other ailments in a significant way. I'll let you draw your own conclusions. Even if acupuncture doesn't have a positive effect, at worst, it's usually harmless. The same can't be said for homeopathy. To learn more about this alternative medicine, check out Julia's video here. According to the National Center for Homeopathy, the first idea is that like cures like. And that's what homeopathy means in Greek, same suffering. Or that something that produces symptoms in a healthy person makes a sick person healthy. So, like caffeine, a molecule that keeps people awake, might be used to treat people with insomnia, but only if caffeine is diluted to very small amounts. Have you ever been acupunctured? Did it help with anything? Do you think it was a placebo effect? Let us know in the comments. Subscribe for more, and I will see you next time on D News. All right, and the last stress reduction technique is therapeutic massage. So um, in therapeutic massage, they use a light to firm touch to release tension, relax muscles, increase blood flow and lymph circulation, and uh, create a sense of calmness. And so there's all kinds of places where you can get massages now, Massage Envy. Um, they ha there's like a lot of little um, places popping up where they'll do like a leg and a foot massage or hand massage um, and there are many benefits to massage and as we talked about earlier on um, a good way to kind of get in touch with your body and figure out where you're holding stress is by getting a massage and feeling where kind of 
the painful parts are or the knots are in your back or wherever. Okay, that is it for Chapter 5, so be sure you submit all six of your lecture activities and complete the assignments associated with this chapter, and we will see you for the next one. Have a great day.